For those wondering, yes, this video took a long time to produce, and I'm so sorry. The main reason this video was delayed was because... Well, was because this was a bit of a difficult subject to tackle. Not because it was a difficult subject for me to understand as a content creator, oh no. I know the term Mary Sue is a useless buzzword that doesn't help creators, critics, or fans. No, I found this difficult because the term, like all buzzwords, is so nebulous, therefore difficult to explain to normal people as to why this piece of fanfic slang needs to die a grisly death and has no place in critical analysis. A lot of novice writers and critics trip up on this term and think it's productive to use it in analysis to explain the failings of a story or character. But unlike a lot of novice writers and critics, I actually put effort into thinking about this, which also solves a lot of problems concerning characters people erroneously call Mary Sues. Now, what exactly is a Mary Sue? Well, I wish I had a straightforward answer for you, but there's not really one. Some might say, oh, they're super beautiful, they're good at everything, they don't have flaws, they don't don't have character development, they're super perfect at everything, guys, ugh. And they warp characters and the world around them to the detriment of the story. However, that's not the only definition you'll come across whenever someone tries to explain what a Mary Sue is. Character is too powerful or has too many powers is like totally OP? Mary Sue. Self-insert character? Ugh, how arrogant. No self-respecting writer would ever do that. Totally a Mary Sue. It's just a power fantasy for them. It's so self-indulgent. A super special race? Mary Sue, cried the lore nerds. Are they the chosen one? Do they have plot armor? So cliche and predictable? Mary Sue, without putting any effort. Loved and appreciated by everyone and is treated like a total badass and legend? Ugh, so unrealistic and unrelatable. How could I appreciate a character who is just good at everything and has everything line up for them oh it's such a mary sue paragon oh what are you jesus mary sue the everyman oh stop trying to appeal to everyone stop trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator mary sue power and skills that come out of nowhere uh so contrived mary sue is the main character a female is she a strong independent woman in any way Burn her! She's a witch and a Mary Sue! Feminism is the devil! Any character type someone does not like, or any badly written character ever? You bet we're just gonna call them a Mary Sue instead of putting in effort. Now, to normal, non-writing folk, these criticisms may sound correct. But as I've said before, just because it sounds correct, doesn't mean it is when you think about it. Now, on a surface level, a lot of these concerns do sound reasonable to worry about. However, like any other lazy shorthand, these concerns and the term itself is coming to a vague conclusion without explaining why these particular character traits are bad. It would be more useful to explain why a character is bad, or why they were poorly executed, or why their part in the story has a problem, and forget about using the term Mary Sue entirely. If you know why a character is bad, or that there is a problem with them, then just explain why. Bear in mind that a lot of these tropes, these character traits, they show up in works of fiction that have stood the test of time. I mean, look at characters like James Bond. He's handsome, he doesn't seem to have any personality flaws, he can get out of every situation like Batman, all the ladies love him, yet he's still considered a major icon in fiction, even to the point where fanboys can't handle a black woman taking on his designation. Not his name, just his designation of 007, you crybabies. I'm also very sure that a lot of people watching this video right now have just used the term to describe a character they don't like, for one reason or another, probably even having a whole list of characters. Although, wanna bet your list may differ from others? Here, let's try it. Here are some characters that I've heard people call, to one degree or another, a Mary Sue. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Tommy Oliver, Harry Potter, Mary's mom, Hermione, Optimus Prime, Princess Twilight, Rarity, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Rey, Katniss Everdeen, Captain Marvel, The Thirteenth Doctor, Gandalf, Korra, Kirito, and... I'm very sure at this very moment, you guys are scratching your heads at some of the names on this list, and go going, what, no way they're a Mary Sue, who said that? It's almost as if the term is very vague and is an excuse to use against characters people don't like for one reason or another, or something very arbitrary and superficial or stupid. Also, notice how a lot of these characters are women? Yeah, here comes the uncomfortable truth. The term is very much used against female characters. In fact, that's how it started when the term was first used. 
The term was originally used in a Star Trek fanzine in the 70s, mostly to act as a parody of self-insert wish-fulfillment fan-made original characters. Now, the problem with coming to that kind of conclusion, and don't pretend you've never done it when you were a geeky teenager, the kind of people writing wish fulfillment like that are teenagers. Very young writers with no experience basically making the written equivalent of fan art. And here's the thing, making wish fulfillment fan fiction for fun where one's OC is irresistible to Damon Salvatore, the Winchester Brothers, Superboy, Nightwing, Sasuke, Zuko, shut up you've all done it, is the one time where having zero writing standards is okay. It's not canon, it's just for fun, it's a stupid fantasy, that's all. So stop being the fun police with your shitty writing standards. I understand wanting to sift past all the crappy fan work and get to the good stuff because you're using fan works as supplementary material until new stuff comes out for your show, but don't confuse writers by boiling down a bunch of problems to two words with a vague description and think you're helping, especially if the creator in question wants to get better as they get older. But sadly, as time went on, the parody and the concept of the Mary Sue started bleeding into fandoms and lazy people started using the term to describe characters they don't like, arbitrarily setting up criteria for good character design and setting up a list of bad character design. This is ignoring the fact that a lot of the character types that I mentioned earlier, who are often synonymous with the term Mary Sue, are seen as adored in some of the best works of fiction still heralded as quality entertainment to this day. The best works works of fiction ignore this so-called list of bad character designs made by people who love this stupid fanfic term. Overly competent? Hello James Bond and Batman. Paragons? Hello Gandalf, Superman, and Shiro. Powers coming out of nowhere? Hello Danny Phantom. Chosen ones as part of a hero's journey? Hello Luke. Hello Harry. Hello Aang. Self-insert author avatars? Hi again, Luke. Hi, Hermione. And yes, George Lucas, Luke S, Luke Skywalker, <laughs> and J.K. Rowling have said they based Luke and Hermione respectively on themselves. Heroes talked about like they're legends, and the story bends over backwards for them. Hey, Tommy! Speaking of Tommy, anyone even with a small experience with Power Rangers will know of Tommy, the Green Ranger, and how he's super awesome, you guys. He's like a legend, you guys. Now, I like Tommy. I freaking love Tommy. He was the most interesting of the original cast, however, that wasn't a high bar to clear, since the writing wasn't on Saban's list of priorities when Power Rangers first came out. However, it's safe to say that Tommy is still beloved and worshipped by fans and showrunners alike. This is despite his personality being as one-dimensional as any other member of the original cast, or even the second set of cast members that came in after for the longest time. We did get some development with Tommy, and some insight into his character in Dino Thunder, but his personality didn't change all that much either since he was in a mentor role. Another issue with Tommy is that he's kind of like Batman, where the franchise seems to worship him, almost as if Tommy is the only one that matters. In a lot of major stories, it seems as if everyone and everything is bending over backwards for Tommy at the expense of the story and everyone else's development. Seriously, we can't have other people shine without Tommy being in the same room, most evident in the Super Ninja Steel Power Rangers Anniversary Special. Tommy is talked up as a legend like always. It's Tommy whose help they need in order to defeat Lord Draven for some reason. It's Tommy who gets the super cool legendary morpher. And it's Tommy who delivers the finishing blow, despite other veteran rangers like Jem, Coda, and Wes appearing. They're eclipsed by Tommy. Now, for those of you in the audience who are itching to use the term Mary Sue and try to defend its existence and the usage of the word, here's the thing. All of that is not a problem with Tommy or his character. Same goes with characters like Batman or Wolverine. It's not an issue with their characters, it's an issue with the story and the priorities and skills of the writers. The writers are kissing Tommy's boots at the expense of everyone and everything else. Andros does not get anywhere near this level of worship despite, you know, saving the frickin' universe. The criticism of Tommy Oliver doesn't mean Tommy himself is a bad character, or that we shouldn't ever have veterans like him return, or that he should never return, because it's cool to see him again. 
I'm saying, don't write a story that you might as well call The Tommy Oliver Show featuring the Power Rangers. It's not the character's fault or even any idea of a character, but rather whether or not it was implemented, handled, or executed well. It all depends on the skills and priorities of the writers, and any good writer can make any idea work. We've been writing Superman for 80 plus years. If him being overpowered or a paragon was a problem for writers, we wouldn't have all these comics and all these wonderful classic stories. The good and the bad. In fact, it was because he had so many powers, was so powerful, was so high concept, and was applicable to most stories is how he survived the 50s and 60s when the popularity of superheroes began to wane. In fact, when America was done fighting the Nazis, Captain America wasn't as relevant anymore, even when they tried to have him fight the Soviets, which is why his comic was put on ice. However, while characters like Tommy, Oliver, Captain America, Superman, and Batman sometimes get labeled as Mary Sue's, there's another more insidious problem with this term. I mentioned how the term started, used to decry female self-insert characters. Well, nowadays it's used predominantly against female characters that people don't like for one reason or another. And yes, we're talking about this. If you've circled the internet, you've seen this term get thrown at characters like Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, and of course Rey from Star Wars that a lot of these lovely ladies have been given more or less similar roles, story arcs, personalities, or even the same power sets as many other famous male characters. Wonder Woman is not only powerful, she's just as much of a paragon as Superman, probably more so since she's willing to compromise herself to save others, like that time she killed Maxwell Lord. Captain Marvel is a powerful soldier who has to come to terms with the fact that the people she's been working for were not the good guys after all, and they were in fact manipulators and liars, kind of like Captain America when S.H.I.E.L.D. collapsed due to Hydra. Their development came in a change of wisdom, of perception, of who they could trust, and who they should ally with. Rey comes from a humble beginning like Luke, she's force sensitive, she saves a droid, gets caught in a war, teams up with Han and Chewie, fights an edgelord, joins the rebellion, and helps blow up a doomsday weapon. I don't know guys, maybe it's your lack of imagination, maybe it's your suspense of disbelief being so frail, but you're telling me you can believe a simple farm boy with little to no experience fighting an evil empire taking out the Death Star, and yet a scavenger girl who picks apart spaceships for a living, and who develops some tech skills over time, and uses those tech skills to repair and pilot the Millennium Falcon, by the way, the Millennium Falcon has been out of Han's possession for a long time now, becoming Force-sensitive, clearly getting used to her powers, and just barely held her own against a wounded edgelord, not killing him by the way, but held her own, is too much for your fragile suspense of disbelief. You guys are so freaking weird! And yes, you can have sexist tendencies while not believing yourself to be sexist. Just throwing that out there, you guys. Chances are, it's because guys like that feel like they can't project themselves onto a character because they're a girl, therefore they think it's bad. But they'll gladly see themselves or project themselves or worship Han Solo, Batman, Captain America, or even James Bond. I sense a double standard going on, dearies. Suddenly, a heroine is a Mary Sue because she's supposedly perfect, never struggles or suffers any losses, which is, of course, a stupidly wrong assumption. If that was the only way to enjoy stories, if that was the only way to find characters engaging, just because they were miserable as the people who like to use the term Mary Sue, and about as sad as Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, yes I went there, we wouldn't have stories like Sword Art Online, Devil's a Part-Timer, Seven Deadly Sins, One Punch Man, and Mob Psycho 100, which have protagonists who could chop the heads off demon overlords and gods with ease, and despite varying degrees of quality, they are still very popular, and I can hear you otaku edgelords crying in the background admit it. Now, despite me saying this term is flimsy and nebulous and vague, to the point where I feel like talking about the existence of good and evil in the universe, or explaining the negative effects of late-stage capitalism would be so much easier than this, I do see 
a sort of common criticism with the term, but it's not even a criticism in regards to character design. So this term is still shit, rather it's a story problem. The criticism slash claim being that a character goes unchallenged by the plot and therefore it's uninteresting and therefore they're considered a Mary Sue. A novice writer has made the mistake of dropping a character who is overly competent or too well equipped in an environment that is not balanced around that character. The world, the story the writer has built is not able to handle the character that they have chosen. Again, like with Tommy Oliver, it's not a problem with the character, it's a problem with the story. Okay, I assume a lot of people here have played D&D, or are at least familiar with the concept of D&D. Okay, so you have your quest set up, the story and adventure in which you want your players to take part in. Now, you have your characters, but oh no, they're very dynamic, they're very diverse in terms of races, classes, and a lot of them have high stats. What will you do? One of them is like a murder tank, one of them is like James Bond and he could be so charismatic and talk his way out of anything, one of them is like a glass cannon, one of them might as well be a demigod or whatever. What will you do? Well, that's kind of simple. Try to understand the characters that you're dealing with, understand their abilities and powers, understand their backgrounds, their stats, what they can do. Beef up your obstacles, give your monsters a little bit more extra brawn, make your environment more challenging, give your NPCs a little bit more of a resistance to charisma, or add more side quests or something if you want to make it more interesting. Maybe add a few more characters who will throw your players off. Balance the world around the characters so that way they will fit. You see this all the time on television as well. Remember Static Shock and how he would team up with other superheroes? Yeah, it would be uninteresting if Superman, Batman, or the Justice League just solved everything for Static and outshined the kid. How do we prevent that? How about the reason Superman is here is because two of his villains happen to be in North Dakota. Villains who have had experience fighting Superman. And to make it doubly fun, one of the villains, let's say Toy Man, exploits both Static and Superman's weaknesses. Like, say, make toy soldiers made of plastic and kryptonite. There! Problem solved! We can make it interesting! Or how about the time that Static joined up with Batman and Robin and the Joker was in North Dakota, and he was getting help from the local metahumans. You know, villains Batman has never met before, and only Static and his unique powers and experiences is best suited to handle this, and even knocked out the Joker too. I just realized if Static were written today, he'd be called a Mary Sue. Oh, he defeated the Justice League, so overpowered. I also noticed that people are quick to use the term Mary Sue when it comes to powers and abilities that seem overpowered at first glance. Supposedly, you can't write a good story if a person's powers are too strong. Well, again, that's bullcrap and it depends on the skills and priorities of the writer, and also their creativity. Have they considered balancing character design with the design of their world and story? The tools of your story are a great way to ensure that your character fits within your story. With Captain Marvel, it was an inhibitor, amnesia. She didn't know who the good guys and the bad guys really were because she was being manipulated by her superiors or she was in space helping out across the universe with the Skrulls or other worlds affected by Thanos' snap. And don't lie! Carol taking down Thanos' ship and her giving him a death stare as he pathetically tried to give her a headbutt was badass and you know it. With Superman, it's either kryptonite, there was magic involved, Superman's moral code is preventing him from doing something, or they're like Lex, the villain is very well prepared, patient, and clever, and they were able to fool or manipulate Superman. No, not you, proto-Lex, fuck off. Taking advantage of a character's morals or lack of awareness or critical thinking abilities is a perfect way of handling uber-powerful and competent characters. In other cases, it's the rules of the world that the writer has made and the other characters within it. With Piper Hallowell from Charmed, yeah, Piper's freezing and combustion power seems too strong at first glance, and she is essentially the most powerful of the three sisters, but to anyone who has actually watched the show, you'll know that Piper's powers have limits. Not every demon freezes or blows up because they're too strong, or they have some sort of magical protection. All these examples are narrative conveniences by the writer to make the story more interesting, and so the characters, again, fit in the story. In case this hasn't hit home for some people yet, another example would be Cosmo and Wanda, Timmy Turner's nigh-all-powerful fairly godparents. If it weren't for the rules, Timmy would be able to wish for anything or would be able to undo his mistakes from a backfired wish very easily every single time. There would be no tension. 
that wouldn't be a problem with the characters, but it would be a problem with the story and the world in which the writer has made, something independent of those characters. Other times, the rules are very specific and clearly a contrivance to move the plot along and keep things interesting, like the rule with a copy spell or the rule involving altered time. Other times, it's not the rules, but rather Cosmo and Wanda got incapacitated or captured, or there would be more other powerful beings who are conveniently impervious to magic like dragons, superheroes, and frickin' gods, or it would be the dreadful butterfly net! <laughs> These are all things that are part of the world or narrative the writer has made to ensure a counterbalance to their uber-special, competent, powerful characters. So after all that, I hope you get what I'm saying. It doesn't matter the power levels, the type of characters, the concepts that you have, or whatever. It all depends on the skills, priorities, and creativity of the writer. Your character can be the most overpowered or overly competent person in history, but so long as you balance the world and story around that character so they will fit, and so long as it feels organic, it'll be fine. Also, it helps to make the story fun, which I know is an even greater challenge in this day and age, but I believe in you young aspiring writers! Tropes, most of the time, are not there to determine whether something is good or bad. They're a jumping off point for your character design or story. Sure, there are some offensive tropes, such as burying your gaze, but the ones people usually conflate with Mary Sue are some of the most cookie-cutter, bare-bones basic concepts. Heck, some of these characters are the basis for these very benign tropes. Tropes. If your only gripe with a character is that they are supposedly too perfect, which everybody has a different idea of what perfection is, then you need to either explain yourself or get the frack out of here while the grown-ups do the talking. One person's Mary Sue can be another person's favorite character. People relate or resonate with different things. In fact, on the subject of relatability, such a thing is a bit low on the list of priorities because, again, people relate to different things. Just because you can't relate to a character, that shouldn't be the point. The point is to find them engaging, to find their stories and adventures engaging. Sure, relatability is one way that you can find a character engaging, but it's not the only way. Many of the characters that I've listed off, I can't really relate to. I can't identify with their experiences, but I still found them engaging. You can't really want 100% relate to characters like Luke Skywalker or Rey, characters who came from humble beginnings, who grew up on a farm, or who grew up on a junkyard, who never really knew their real parents, but discovered some larger-than-life destiny. Maybe you could even look up to these people even if you can't relate to them. Maybe you'd want to be as brave as Luke or Rey. Maybe you'd want to be as kind and compassionate as Wonder Woman or Superman, a born leader like Optimus Prime, strong-willed and confident like Captain James or Carol Danvers, clever as Batman, or as smooth as James Bond. We've been writing stories about so-called Mary Sues for a long time, you guys. If they were so inherently bad, so detrimental to writing, then we wouldn't continue making stories about them at all. Maybe it's time to reevaluate how we critique another person's character and stop holding up shitty writing standards that wouldn't hold up in any writing class. So knock it off with the fanfic slang and and tell us in detail as to why you think this character is bad and without using other buzzwords. I know it's easier to just use a half-baked term instead of describing the topic in detail, but here's the thing, you don't have to open your trap if you refuse to explain yourself in serious discussion. To anyone who wants to take writing seriously and improve on their storytelling or critiquing skills, fear of characters who are supposedly too perfect is an unnecessary limitation and a detriment to one's creativity. Your character will get called a Mary Sue by virtue of being overpowered, competent, being a special race, having a weird aesthetic, or just because of a story problem that acts independently of that character and then blame the character. It's best to just ignore the buzzword entirely or force the person to actually explain what they mean. The people who focus on things like power levels too much are the kind of people who think the only way to build tension is by hitting things and that's kind of the limitation of their critiquing skills. If we kept worrying about Mary Sue's, we wouldn't be writing about super special orphans going off to magic school, teenagers becoming superheroes, super-powered icons, fairy godparents, and rebels battling space Nazis. And always remember, another person's Mary Sue is gonna be another person's favorite character. So fuck off. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go reread Jason Aaron's run on Mighty Thor. You know, the female Thor. Jane Foster as Thor, because by the gods, these stories are awesome. And Jane herself is an awesome character. She truly knows what it means to be worthy. This is Garnet, back together. And I'm never going down at the hands of the likes of you because I'm so much better. And every part of me is saying go get her. The two of us ain't gonna follow your rules. Come at me without any of your fancy tools. Let's go, just me and you. Let's go, just one on two. Go ahead and try and hit me if you're able. Can't you see that my relationship is stable? 